Well, thank you everyone for uh, being here with us today. My name is Jesse Fleming and I'm a fourth year doc student at the University of Virginia. And um, I'll let uh, Brian and Suzanne and Danielle introduce themselves real quick. Um, Brian Cook, I'm a professor in special education at the University of Virginia. Hi, I'm Suzanne Spicer. I am a first year doctoral student at the University of Virginia. Hi everyone, I'm Danielle Waterfield. I'm also a first year doctoral student at the University of Virginia. Excellent. Well, um, what we wanted to do today in the workshop and um, we feel uh, no need to go the entire hour. So if, it, if we finish before then, great. Um, if we take the whole time, that's great too. But what we wanted to do today was kind of introduce this idea of managing your, your preprints and your open access. Um, oftentimes we talk about, you know, preprints as a singular event, you post it and you're done. And really what we want to kind of introduce today is a way to kind of, we're going to talk about why we post preprints, you know, the rationale behind it, but then really um, how can you keep up with your preprints and ensure that uh, you have the most recent uh, research out and available for folks to read. So um, our agenda for today, as I mentioned, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the benefits of open access. Uh, we'll talk about the types of open access and the types of green open access, which is kind of the focus of today's talk. Um, we'll, we'll discuss some key terms and ideas for you. We'll talk through some recommendations and maybe some challenges that folks have, provide a few resources, and then we'll walk through how to submit and update um, your preprints and postprints on EdArchive. So I'll pass it over to Thanks, uh, Jesse. Yeah. So, um, and I think people have access to the chat. Um, I'm curious, uh, and, and it'll help us, and, and you can just, um, if you wanna turn your camera on or you can put it in the chat, but just on a scale of one to three, um, familiarity, background, expertise in um, uh, open access, publishing, and, and especially preprints and, and postprint. So is like one, I've not really, I've not done this. I don't have much familiarity. I've heard of it, but I, I really don't know much about it. Two, I might've done it once, or I, I know a fair amount about it, but don't have a lot of expertise. And, and three being I've done it quite a bit, um, or I've done it at least a few times. I'm comfortable with it, but looking to kind of um, maybe get some some higher level um, understanding and, and some specific things. So uh, chime in and kind of let us know. Every presenter's dream so far, ones and threes. Uh, so, but some threes, good, good. All right, we will move fairly quickly um, through this and I encourage everyone, if you wanna do the, the hand raise or, or just put something in the chat, uh, feel free and, and we encourage you to, to just uh, chime in, ask questions, share. You all know things that we don't know. Um, so, so it would be great to, to learn from, from all of you as well and, and share. So, so feel free in that regard. So open access publishing, um, I, I think probably by being here, you're aware of many of these benefits. Um, the, the basic idea of open access publishing is making papers freely accessible by removing the, the, the paywall uh, that publishers put up. Um, and so the, the benefits are, I, I think, of the many different open science practices that, that we've been talking about at the conference. To me, the open access publishing is one that, that just has clear benefits um, and especially the, the green uh, approach model that we'll be talking about today. So some of those benefits certainly include um, equity. And I think at, at the core, uh, this is the issue that we have a lot of scholarship that is, is only available to some people. And, and that's just not, not equitable. And uh, for those who can afford to pay or those that are at institutions that subscribe and, and pay a lot of money to publishers. And, and that leaves a lot of people out. Um, I remember hearing Brian Nosek speak once and he was visiting and I don't remember where, but a university and he was talking, Brian's background is in psychology. And so he asked, 
this group of doc students he was talking to, what area of psychology are, are they in? And they all said the same area. And he said, wow, that's that's uh, remarkable. That must be what, what your um, a real strong focus of your program. And they said, yeah, I guess, but it's because that's the, the one uh, totally open access journal that, that we can uh, get at in the field. And, and so that just so drove um, what they could study because they could only access uh, scholarship in, in this area. Um, and, uh, and, and we see the same thing certainly in practice. Um, and, and so in an applied field like education, where we're trying to bridge the research to practice gap and, and get, uh, it, it's the point of a lot of what we're doing is to in, inform practice if if the intended end users of our research and scholarship can't access much of that, um, it, it we're just shooting ourselves in the foot here by publishing in in journals that that put the the work behind paywalls. Um, so that that greater equity leads to increased uh, the scope of of audience and, and greater impact. And and uh, we'll have a slide in a minute that looks at at citation um, index. I, I shouldn't be reading the the uh, the chat box as I talk. Sorry, I'll, I'll look at that later. Um, and and there's good evidence to support that uh, work that is is a uh, scholarship that is open access gets cited more often, has a greater uh, play in in social media and in lots of different um, measures of impact, which makes a whole lot of sense because it it just can be accessed by a much uh, larger audience. Um, quicker availability of findings. So this is a bit of a double-edged sword in some ways, as we'll talk about one of the big issues or concerns around preprints in particular, is that they haven't gone through, uh, haven't been vetted through peer review. But the other side of that, um, or the, I guess to state the obvious in some ways, the downside of that is that there can be some, some really uh, flawed, uh, perhaps misleading uh, research that that is shared, but it certainly uh, shaves off the the time associated with peer review. And this has really come to the fore during the pandemic when there was a great need to get things out there. You see a lot more coverage of of research um, from preprints because time is real was really of the essence. Um, and sometimes it's it's many months, if not years, between when the start of peer review and when something gets published. And so this allows work to, to get out there more quickly. Combats the file drawer problem, the publication bias, things that people might not submit for publication or might not get accepted for publication, but is still good quality work, such as uh, studies with null effects um, that can get that can get published and be accessed by others. Uh, Jesse is is a uh, uh, recently been on the job market, and, and he found this to be a very useful tool to uh, share uh, work that was still being reviewed, not published yet, um, but it's it's a way to uh, disseminate one one's work uh, before it gets uh, published to, to different audiences. And then um, finally, you can actually both uh, solicit, do targeted solicitation, or just open it up for feedback for folks. Uh, before one uh, submits their work for publication, uh, preprints can be one way to, to get feedback on, on one's work. Danielle. All right. So we know that you can kind of gauge the accessibility of different research through different journals based on going to the journal site or even sometimes doing something like a Google Scholar search will also show you the accessibility options. Um, so Brian pulled the screenshot of a recent Teaching Exceptional Children journal article that we can see it's restricted to access, but it's on a really vital topic, culturally and linguistically diverse families to participate. That's something that's super relevant for schools um, today that we would want practitioners, administrators, families to have access to. But as we can see, it's restricted access. So if you clicked on the get access button, you would then get a page that looked like 
this, asking you to pay a cool $37.50 to access this article for 24 hours, which if you are like me, um, a doctoral student may not be within your budget. It may not be in a practitioner's budget. And so this might not be feasible for all audiences um, or for you know dissemination purposes. And imagine that times if you're a, a practitioner or a parent chasing down many, many different articles, you can't read it yet. You don't know if that's relevant or not. And you're trying to find out what to do with your kid or what to teach in your class the next week or for doc students um, who, who don't have uh, access through their through their library to certain journals. You might want to download a lot. Thirty-seven fifty for one article. Well, that's that's not great, but but imagine that uh, across uh, many 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 articles, it quickly becomes um, unfeasible. Yes, I don't even want to know the actual cost of all the articles in my Zotero right now. Um, that would be quite uh, alarming, maybe. Um, but <laughs> I have been able to find articles through open access through my institution as well. And there are different colors of open access um, articles that you can find. Uh, gold is perhaps the most commonly used one, um, but green is the one that we we're trying to focus on today. And they have different distinctions here. Brian pulled this great visual. Um, we were talking earlier about how uh, the hybrid one is represented by a griffin because it's different pieces of these different types of open access put together. Um, and it just kind of shows you the different ways that open access can um, appear to you as a researcher, but also to people that you're disseminating research to. Brian, did you want to add anything on this beautiful spectrum? Sure. I can't help it. Uh, so Diamond, I think we're actually going to start seeing more and more Diamond journals right now. They are kind of very, they, they tend to be small uh, journals that, that don't pay. Hola, ¿qué tal? Sometimes potentially um, they are predatory journals, unfortunately. Um, but this is where authors don't pay. Uh, article processing charges and consumers don't pay for the articles. They're just open. Uh, gold o o OA, you have to pay the article processing char uh, charges. Uh, so that can be um, substantial in some cases. Um, bronze is great, but the, the question mark with bronze is the publishers just choose to make it open. It isn't licensed o o open access. So that can change at a moment's notice and it's just not reliable or, or long-term. And so green open access, as, as we'll talk about, um, it, it, it isn't costly. It can be, uh, it, it's available long-term. Um, and, and so it has a lot of advantages and that's where we'll focus today. So this is, um, and, and, and I need to find out how to pronounce her name. If anyone knows, they can tell me right now and save me some embarrassment. Um, uh, I'm going to guess Pivovar um, has, has done a lot of really nice work in this area. Uh, 2018, she and her colleagues did a, a very large scale multidisciplinary uh, review of the types of, of open, open access uh, publications uh, across time. And you'll see that it, it is getting... In 2018, it was close to almost 50% um, multidisciplinary. We did a review. I'm not pleased. Um, actually, we used we just used the open access button. And in our little field of special education, we found a much lower rate of um, open access articles. More, Jesse, I don't know if you remember. I think it was 20, give or take 25%. It was about a quarter of the articles, but I think the open access button unfortunately missed uh, some. So I suspect it's higher than that. But you really see that there is more and more uh, open access uh, uh, available out there. And the big growth seems to be in, in gold journals um, with, with a hybrid growing as well. But the biggest area is actually bronze where publishers um, and I hope I'm getting the colors right because I'm colorblind, but I'm, I'm thinking that's the right order. Um, that uh, bronze, th they're not reliable. It comes and goes. Um, green doesn't seem to be growing recently, but it, the in the article, they talk about that that is to some degree, at least an artifact of their coding procedures, where a lot of these articles are actually or a lot of these papers are actually available green, but published in a gold journal or published in a hybrid journal or are, or are available 
uh, via bronze open access. And if, if a, a green article was also available in another way, they coded it um, under one of these other ways. So in some ways, I think the static or even slightly diminishing um, number of, of green publications just reflects the growing number of, of other uh, types of open access publications. And this is that open access advantage that, that um, we were talking about. And I don't want to belabor this, but bronze hybrid green, uh, much higher than, than average uh, amount of, of citation. It, it, citations. Interestingly, gold, that's not the case, which is somewhat counterintuitive. And the authors hypothesize because uh, oftentimes these journals are, are just very small journals that aren't accessed very often. So they actually have the lowest level of um, citations. But other air, other ways to make uh, papers uh, open access seem to, to result in uh, greater uh, access and which translates into a uh, greater impact in citations. Is this you, Suzanne? Yes, it is. Um, so although uh, the uh, green publications may not be the largest subset, there are a lot of advantages for uh, the green open access. Um, so we're focusing here on green because it is free and it's an option for everyone. Um, so there are some different types of green open access we're going to highlight for here. Uh, some are the independent or nonprofit um, kinds of green open access. Uh, for example, we have uh, preprints.org or we have something that is discipline specific. So in education, uh, ed archive is an area where uh, you can uh, post your preprints. You also have some for-profit archives, some uh, something like ResearchGate. I know some people may be familiar with uh, ResearchGate and have found some uh, pre and post prints there as well. Um, you also have institutional repositories um, that are through the university or the, uh, the group that you work with. Uh, so UVA, for example, uses uh, Libre Open, and that would be an option of uh, preprints for you as well. Or uh, the researcher's personal website would be an option in order to, um, to publicly post these things. So we're gonna show you uh, two different uh, screenshots of what these look like. This is an example of uh, Ed Archive. This is uh, that independent nonprofit um, that is discipline specific for education. So as you can see, it works both ways. You're able to submit a preprint as a researcher, and then you're able to update uh, through Ed Archive. You're also able to search through the search bar and be able to locate uh, preprints through that as well. And then uh, another option that we talked about is the institutional repository. This is an example of the University of Virginia one, uh, Libra Open. So again, you are able to, as the researcher, go in and post your preprints in that way and uh, organize them in that fashion, share them that way. Back to me. Uh, this is me. Oh, but, take but it if away. You take over, if you want to take over, go ahead. Um, so one, one quick note, uh, thank you, Suzanne, for that. Um, when I first kind of got into preprints, um, I thought it would maybe be beneficial to kind of put my preprint out in as many places as possible. Um, but it's important to remember that each of those pre, in most places when you post a preprint, they come with a, a DOI, a digital object identifier, I think is what it's called. Yeah. And, um, and so when tracking citations and things of that nature, it might get a little, tricky if you have a bunch of different DOIs for the same paper. So I found that it's helpful to kind of pick one repository and use that um, and then link that one preprint or postprint to the, the, the published paper. So something to think about as if you're kind of diving into preprints for the first time. So we've been talking a lot about different terms uh, that we've been using preprint and postprint and what does that mean? Um, there's not a, a real hard definition out there but uh, what we kind of go by and what others have kind of gone by is that a preprint is just your, your author formatted paper that you will submit mm -hmm. to a journal. It doesn't have to be submitted to a journal, but it's kind of this idea of it's your paper in a Word doc uh, before you submit it to a journal. And then a postprint is that is a, is a preprint that has under, uh, gone, undergone, 
excuse me, undergone peer review. And so um, we would think of a post print as having been improved through um, peer, you know, peer feedback, peer review, um, and, and made that better. And so in some instances, we might see some journals or um, publishers um, want to put a hold on kind of when you can share that post print because of the value added through peer review and through that journal. So we'll, we'll talk about that segue into some additional ideas. Um, so an APC, an article processing charge, this doesn't actually apply to green open access as it, there's no charge to share your papers on uh, preprint repositories. But uh, it, you know, if you, if you begin to think about other um, types of open access, whether that's hybrid or, or gold, um, they, just know that there might be a charge associated with that. And in some cases it, it can be very large. Uh, it can be a lot of money. In special education, the average APC is about $3,000. So uh, yeah, it's not a, a small uh, chunk of change. And, uh, and then the journal, it can be really large. I think it was is some of the nature journals now, they're over $10,000 a pop for uh, article processing charges to make your uh, paper open. Yeah, so um, publishers find ways to make money no matter how much we try, right, Brian? Um, I we won't get political on this because it's being recorded, but um, uh, an embargo is a, uh, a period of time when you have to hold off on posting that post print. As I mentioned, uh, that value added in some instances, uh, journals or publishers will want you to hold off on sharing that post print because in many instances, it, it could be very similar to the, to the uh, published paper. And then finally, we have open access licenses. So if you go to um, at Archive or another preprint repository, they'll ask you to select a license. And this is really a key to open access because it's, it's a license that allows it to be open for others to use. And so when looking at different publishers, um, some have different embargo periods on, on post prints. Um, most don't have an embargo period on, on preprints. Um, you might run into a few journals that don't want you to post a preprint and put that in their policies. But for the most part, um, publishers are fine with you posting a preprint. So it's important to check both journal, uh, to check the journal policy as well as publisher policy. But as you'll see here, um, so for many of us, at least in special ed, we use Sage a lot. So you can see there's no embargo. Um, Springer um, average about 12 months. Taylor and Francis, 12, 18 months. And then um, the mothership, Elsevier, 12 to 48 months. So uh, important to, to consider and, and know about and um, read up on before you kind of select a, a journal where you're going to publish your work. Jesse, can I jump in for just a second? Of course, yeah. So I think it's important here too in the second column, these are for the author's accepted manuscripts. So these are, they're post prints but they're not the the published um, the, they're not the PDF of the publication. They are your it, it's the final version of the manuscript, except perhaps for for copy final copy edits. Uh, but it's it's a PDF of your Word document probably, or you might format it differently. But it, it it's your it's the author's version. But it's it's the final version. And so most publishers, not all publishers, but most uh, publishers, you can post that. For many of them, it's after a year or a year and a half or two years, or in some Elsevier journals, up to four years. But for some journals, including Sage, which just happens to be a uh, publisher, yes, the link is is um, the the links at the bottom there. Um, and and I think we'll make these slides available. I think they'll, they'll be posted on um, on OSF. Um, but Sandra, feel free to just um, email me, and I can I can share it with you too. Um, that that it really varies by publisher, and this is something that that uh, they put together. Jesse and I did a review a couple of years ago of journals uh, and publishers in the special education field, and we found it quite difficult sometimes to discern exactly what the policy was. And it's interesting in in my discussion with uh, different journal editors, they typically don't know and largely don't care. <laughs> um, 
and but but of course we want to um, ad- adhere to the to to the requirements. The and and this is what you're signing very often when you sign a copyright uh, when an article a copyright form when an article is accepted to abide by uh, these type of things. But it is really nice, and it might be something that you think about uh, in terms of where you're going to be submitting to. To me, to be able to post the accepted version the day that something gets accepted uh, with no embargo at all is a huge advantage. And and makes me that that's a consideration that that I make when I'm submitting to a journal. And one one thing that's been helpful for Brian and I is to um, become friends with your. If you work in an institution, your institution librarians, um, they're huge advocates not only in open access, but they often um, have experience navigating a lot of these different policies. So it doesn't hurt to reach out to your librarians and. Um, ask them for help if you're unsure of um, what the policy is. Okay, so when uh, you are posting your preprint, um, I know some people think of preprints as kind of anarchy, just throw it out there. Uh, but there, uh, in, in most preprint repositories, we have a system where you're still, you know, um, have a, a copyright license for your work and you can kind of determine uh, how others use and interact with your work. And so um, most people are very familiar with the Creative Commons licenses. So the CCBY, uh, CCBYSA. And so um, as you're going through, and we'll show in a little bit, there's options for some of these different licenses. Um, but most will will pick either this um, by attribution. So others can copy, distribute, display, perform, and remix your work if they give you credit or this um, no derivative work. So they can use it, but they can't kind of remix it and um, uh, build upon what you've done. Okay, a few concerns. Um, obviously, uh, this one gets brought up a lot, that you know, preprints haven't gone under, uh, undergone peer review, um, which it is, it is a concern. I, I think there's um, a, a lot of, you know, preprints that are very strong and not very flawed out there. And there's a lot of papers that are out there that are also flawed, right? And so um, it's important to recognize, um, but I think preprints can still be very valuable, uh, potentially for researchers, um, as we've mentioned earlier. And if maybe someone doesn't have the advanced training, they can use a preprint to determine if they want to you know, purchase this paper in the future, or if they want to reach out to the researcher and ask for it. And so I think there's still a lot of benefits to preprints, despite them not being peer reviewed. And, um, you know, pre and post prints, um, they may vary by published version. And I know some researchers don't like this idea of having a paper out there where it's, um, you know, different from maybe the final version. But I think it's kind of important to go back to this idea. The importance is, as um, Brian Nosek discussed this morning or this afternoon of openness and transparency. It's really important to kind of open up this process and it's okay for others to see that, yes, everyone knows your paper changed and improved. It's okay if that's out there um, and if it might be a little bit different than um, the published version. And and, and, I, and I think I, I, I wrote that bullet and I, I don't think I did a great job phrasing it. I, I think the the concern, that, at least one of the concerns here, is that when you download a print from uh, an archive, you really don't know, is this a paper that has been published and it is verbatim the published version? It's just formatted differently? Or is this a paper that has not been published? Is this a paper that has been published, but it, it is very different from the published version without providing that information, which... I know when I first started um, uh, posting preprints, I just posted a paper and I thought that's great. And look, people are downloading it. That's wonderful. But it's 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 challenging then for the consumer to know how to how to make sense of uh, you, kind of what version of the paper is this? The final version? There is no other version, or this is very different from the published version that they may or may not be able to access. And really, you know, the recommendations that we're providing today are very simple, uh, but they can lead to a lot more, you know, a lot more clarity for consumers and readers of research who are approaching this preprint, like you said, Brian, unsure of where it's at in the process. And so I think it's very different, uh, you know, a a postprint that's been updated multiple times, 
and we know it's been published in a reputable journal versus a preprint that's being posted for the first time, we might approach those a little bit differently. Um, and so a few recommendations. Um, it, what, one of the things that is most challenging about this is um, up, updating these preprints throughout the process. And I know many people kind of have a workflow where they've established, all right, this paper's in uh, data collection, this paper is, I'm writing, this paper is um, under peer review, and this paper I'm revising and resubmitting, right? And what we need to do is simply add on these additional uh, steps for posting and updating preprints in that process. And so, for example, when you submit a preprint for review, uh, at the same time you post that manuscript to um, a preprint repository such as EdArchive. Um, when you uh, receive feedback from peer review and you revise and resubmit, um, you when you resubmit, you update that preprint into a postprint on EdArchive. And then when uh, you, you get that great news that it's being published, you take that author, um, that accepted version of the manuscript and update it one more time and then add some additional language in there that, hey, this has been accepted. Here's where you can find um, the, the published paper and the DOI to the published paper. And so um, not just updating it, but making sure we're clearly indicating at what step of the process this journal, this paper is at, is very important for um, consumers of research. And so this is kind of what we've been talking about. But um, you know, we start out with this preprint. We submit it to a journal for peer review. It comes back. Um, we make changes to it. We update it. It becomes a postprint, and then finally, uh, it gets to the published version of the manuscript. It's important to note that. Um, almost never, unless it's a gold or diamond version, uh, a, a gold or diamond uh, journal, are we sharing the, the PDF copy edited version of that paper um, um, online freely to, a, you know, to be accessed by anyone out in the universe, right? And so um, uh, generally when we think about green open access, we're really limiting ourselves to the author version of that paper, uh, whether it's before peer review, or after peer review. And then this is a, um, uh, this is something I, I, I developed during the pandemic when we had loads of time and there was nothing better to do. Um, but essentially this is a flow chart and we'll link this for you in the chat on getting started and kind of going through all these steps of um, pre-printing and post-printing your papers. Uh, once it gets accepted, go back and and update it and et cetera. And so we'll share this with you. Um, a few people have told me that it's helpful. So happy to share this resource with you as once again, wherever you're at in this preprint journey, um, hopefully it can be helpful as you make it part of your workflow and continue to post and update your preprints. And it really, it, Jesse did a really nice job of laying out all of the kind of considerations here. It's not as convoluted as it, as it looks, it, it, it is basically just kind of an expansion with more considerations of the previous slide, which, which just kind of lays out. And, and I have started to adopt this. And like a lot of things, once you start to make it part of your workflow, it's, it's, it, it, it becomes much easier. Um, a a, a co-author submitted a, a paper today and I, is everyone okay with, with submitting this as a preprint? Send me that, uh, the, the last version of it. And I, it, it's out, um, it, it, it's out. And, and because I'm the moderator for Ed Archive, I accepted it right away. And <laughs> it is um, now available as a preprint. And then um, depending on, on our time and, and how much uh, substantive changes and how many uh, rounds of review it goes through, we might, um, update that as it goes through review. And then actually this isn't for a SAGE journal. So I'm going to have to look up the embargo period for Wiley. But as soon as for SAGE journals, which is what I tend to publish in, um, then as soon as it's accepted, I post a, a post print with the final version of it. And it's just, it, it kind of just goes through that, that process, which is, it's a lot of arrows, but that's what uh, is represented <laughs> here. Okay. Brian, I think you're up. And so this is just an example of, of a recent paper um, that I did to, to try to make some of this con concrete here. So um, 
it, it is a, a paper that's recently been accepted and is now available online. It, it hasn't been published uh, yet um, in, in one of a SAGE journal in our field of special education, exceptional children. Um, and so this is just what it looks like on Ed Archive where I posted a couple things to point out. Um, part of which we'll go over very briefly here. Uh, we stated there were no conflicts of interest. There are data uh, publicly available for it um, and, and pre-registration that are, uh, the pre-registration is available as well. And just some of the points of Ed Archive that list the views and downloads for you. Um, go ahead, Jesse. And so this is just, we couldn't fit it all in one screen and make it legible. This is the bottom. And so this is what I put, I don't think there's anything magical about this, but I've gotten more um, detailed. I've seen some uh, sites or, or some authors do this with a watermark, but this is the, the second version. So it tells you what um, version it is. And so I posted a preprint initially, and then when it was accepted as a Sage journal, we immediately posted uh, the post print. And so this is version two. If I wanted to just to the left of this, I can download previous versions and this isn't live, but I could click and then um, access the initial preprint that was posted. And to, to be clear and, and to try to be transparent over what version is, uh, what version this is, um, I indicated that this has uh, gone through peer review. It's been accepted. Here's the DOI, which I included there, but is also by default. Um, you can add that into um, the, uh, when, when you upload uh, a version. So it's listed here as well. Right above that is the DOI of the preprint. One of the really nice things though, when this gets, if someone was to cite the preprint because the DOI is linked, that would actually um, kind of get credited to, to the journal and to the, the published uh, paper. I think that's all I wanted to cover here. So this is actually just a, a little screenshot at the bottom of the initial preprint. And so here is a paper. The paper has not undergone peer review. And I just, I don't know if it's absolutely necessary, but I thought it couldn't hurt. Um, it was submitted for peer review on this date. I, in some ways, I, I'd like to put this in, maybe I should have put it in in big, uh, bigger font and, and like, you know, <laughs> I'd like to highlight it in some way. I think this is really important, but this is on page one. And, and this is as much as anything, I think what is one of the things that, that we think is real important, realizing that you can update these different versions of them. There is a transparent record then in 99.9% .9 of cases, I bet no one's gonna go back and look to see what changes were made from, uh, from the initial submission to the publication, but it's there if someone wanted to. Um, but the idea that during the, the months, the many months that this was under peer review, and uh, I forget, but I think it went through two rounds of of peer review that um, th that this was available, but it was clear that it had not yet been peer reviewed, which I think is just really critical for consumers to know. So so stating that there um, in combination with um, putting multiple versions out, um, ending with the post print that uh, corresponds with the published version as soon as one can. Um, with the embargo uh, that is um, imposed by the, the journal, which interestingly, I'm just as an aside, the OSTP memo, if it is funded research, um, I think it's by the end of 2025, there are gonna be no embargoes um, for um, work that comes out of uh, federally, uh, US federally funded um, research, which I, th there are different funding agencies have different agreements in different countries. Um, uh, around embargo periods. And Brian, uh, some researchers have already um, begun replicating this paper, right? Before it's been published? Good point. Um, yeah, so this is the second time this has happened to me where um, we've been contacted about other authors replicating um, our work that was posted as a preprint before the 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 work was actually published in a journal. So it I think it just is a, a kind of a testament to the the uh, in, potential impact in the scholarly community by putting these uh, preprints out there that people are not only um, accessing them, 
but they're 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 replicating them and and how this can accelerate the pace of science um when it isn't slowed down by waiting potentially multiple years until something is available after it's done to go through peer review there is the flip side of that though that um you know if this ended up being a horrible paper that shouldn't have been published then maybe there is um someone who who didn't um have the background to to discern that might be um, influenced in one way or another by by a paper that hadn't undergone peer review, but that's um, why you know, we're encouraging, um, in the spirit of transparency, to put that on the to, to make that clear on the, on the cover page of the the, the print. So uh, just a, a, a couple of resources that we found helpful. The the traditional recommendation is, is Sherpa Romeo. Uh, to, to look up and, and find uh, journal OA policies. Um, I know at one time when I was uh, looking at this more closely in, in our um, somewhat smaller field of special education, not all the journals were there, not all the information was necessarily updated. Um, that's probably not the case now, but um, I, I think for all of these things, it's probably worth double checking uh, with the, the, the journal and or the publisher site. Uh, one thing that I uh, have just found a, a, about recently, share your paper. When you publish a paper, you can enter your DOI and it will tell you the journal's policies for uh, journal policy for sharing post prints. And so I can tell you, post that post print. You're available. You can. Or mm, you got to wait 12 months to do it. But you can check that. When I first started doing this, um, I went through a little period where the, oh, this is past the embargo for everywhere. You know, something that I published 10 years ago. The issue was then going back and finding the the uh, the, the document, and I oftentimes uh, wasn't able to do that. But when I was able to find the final document, I could post that now, and that's even if it is uh, old, that's great to have it out there, open access. Then, and then the final thing, um, hashtag Pretty Preprints uh, OSF makes available different print print templates. Uh, which will show you uh, at least uh, one of those uh, coming up here in a second. But you can make your Word document uh, formatted to look a lot like a journal article, which you know, we're kind of of two minds about. I don't think that's the point. But um, who was when we were talking earlier about the, I, I, I forget, Danielle, Suzanne, and or Jesse mentioned that um, it, it can actually make different audiences take the take the paper more seriously when it's formatted like a, like a journal. But then I think that kind of highlights the importance of, of being very clear about whether this is the final version or that you know that that this isn't actually the, the published article when it's not. And so this is just a screenshot of shareyourpaper.org. And so that uh, paper that we referenced early in the the, the talk um, from Teaching Exceptional Children, which is the premier um, practitioner journal in our field um, that we thought, wow, it's a shame this isn't uh, uh, available um, open access for parents and, and teachers and, and other folks. Um, you put in that DOI and this is what it says, that uh, find the manuscript that the journal accepted. It's not the PDF from the journal site. It's not the, the journal formatted. Uh, paper, but uh, you find the the manuscript and you can post it. It's a it's a Sage journal, like many in in our field are. So there is no embargo. Um, post it today, and I, I almost <laughs> I just looked. I I just picked one from the the most current uh, issue up there, but I, I kind of feel like writing all the authors for <laughs> from from the current issue and say, you know, you can post this. Take a look at this this presentation. We'll tell you how. And this is just an example of uh, from the one of the the formats, one of the templates for uh, pretty preprints that that you can use to to make your your word document look like a uh, journal article if if you're so inclined. And then the rest of it, let's see how we're doing. Um, this will be available. Maybe should we just skim through it super fast so we have a few minutes if if people want to chat. We'll go through this. Stop us if you have any questions. This is submitting on Ed Archive. I'm not good with this stuff, and I can do it. So it it, it isn't that hard. Uh, this is just a screenshot of the. I couldn't fit it all in one. We couldn't fit it all in one here. So we've got the the top. These are the areas that you have to fill in. You just upload the file from your computer. 
Um, go ahead to the next screen, Jesse. And this is the other areas which the rest of it is is just going through. Um, and and so we'll, we'll, we'll just look at those super, super quickly here. And at the end, you submit preprint. It does go through moderation, which is Jesse and I, and we check it more days than not. And basically we make sure you haven't said something that there's not huge, awful things in there. We're not in the business of peer reviewing. We're just making sure that the uh, content is, is an education um, and, and um, is, is just not something that, that shouldn't be posted publicly. So this is author assertions. They want to know if there's public data or, and, and or pre-registration. We just check. This is the basics. You can choose a license and there's a drag down menu of the different licenses you can choose from. If it is a post print and that you can put the DOI for the publication, um, keywords that you want to have that are searchable, um, paste in the abstract, which is then um, uh, available when, when people search. You can choose um, disciplinary keywords to identify the paper. Um, you you uh, upload authors, and if they're uh, if they don't have an account through OSF, you have to add them. But it's real easy. You just um, put in their name and their um, email address. Conflict of interest? Yes, no. If you have any supplemental materials that you want to upload, you upload them. And I think that is it. And then the last thing that we wanted to note, um, once this is posted, if, and in this case we don't because we already updated, it's the final version, but if it wasn't and we wanted to change it when um, I log in um, and go to one of uh, my preprints that I have administrative control over, there's a button uh, there to edit the preprint and you click on that and you basically just upload the new version and it comes up as a, a new version. You have the option to change other information like the abstract, or you know maybe there's there's a data available now, or um, if you want to change any of the other uh, metadata, you can at that time as well. And that's it. We're done. Um, so again. Uh, you all probably have different tricks of the trade that we don't know about. And uh, if you have any questions or, or thoughts or concerns about any of this, we'd love to, to hear it. Um, or we could also go eat. <laughs> I do know, let's see, where did it go? Um, I think it was, uh, Neil brought up a point that we have wrestled with. Um, what, so posting a, a preprint, how does that impact uh, masked peer review? And, and it is something that we've um, struggled with. And there are certain, there have been a, a couple of instances when I kind of thought it, it was a bit of an esoteric topic where people maybe within my, closer within my circle, uh, I thought might be reviewing it. And that if I posted a preprint and and uh, tweeted about it, that they then might not be available as, as mass peer reviewers. And so what I've done actually now, and I, and I, I did, I, th I thought about this a fair amount. At one point I thought, eh, it's not my problem. That's the reviewer, that's the editor's problem. And there's plenty of reviewers in, in the sea out there, although we do know that journals are really struggling to, to find enough editors for a lot or uh, reviewers for a lot of papers. Um, so you might not want to shoot yourself in the foot that way. But what I do now is I post a, 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 a preprint. I like having that available just for the, the broader uh, community. Uh, but if I do have concerns uh, about uh, the pool of, of a kind of tainting the, the the pool of or minimizing the the pool of potential reviewers, I won't tweet about it um, or, or I won't try to publicize it. And uh, there is the concern that people could discover it. Um, as, as I think Crystal had, had put in the chat, I do think if people really want to find, if reviewers really want to find out, um, they, they can probably in most instances figure out who the author is, especially in smaller fields. Um, I, I, I tend to be okay with trusting the, 
the reviewers and, and the editor's discretion about this. And I, I, I tend not to try to publicize the pre-print as much as I do the post-print because it, it, it has occurred after the peer review process is done then. I have a quick question for you. Uh, this was great today. Thank you for the resources. Um, I really like that you talked about equity in terms of being able to access articles. That's where I started to become very, very interested in open science was when I was still providing services in the field and couldn't get at the articles I needed to, to be able to do best practices. Heck yeah. And I, and I found workarounds by being on committees for students and then they had to give me access to the databases. But um, that's Ned, that won't work for everyone. But the, the flip side of that that I'm finding is with these hefty fees, you know, I worry about equity too on the other publishing side. Um, as publishers start to go towards this and then charge those fees, new new graduates, new you know assistant professors, people like that who may not have hefty grants to be able to pay those fees also are going to have trouble. And then we're also going to have kind of a missing data problem if they can, you know, if we're really limited in terms of which journals we could afford to publish in. Have you had many talks about that? I like that a lot of the universities are starting to band together to kind of get like larger contracts to be able to publish some open access without fees. Would love your thoughts on that if you've um, found some solutions to that. Well, I don't, I don't know if it's a solution exactly, but I think it may be. And, and I, and I just didn't do a good enough job emphasizing it here. So that's a problem with the, the gold journals that are charging and, and hybrid uh, with the article processing charges, which can be quite substantial, especially if you're publishing a fair amount. Um, but the green has no cost associated with it. And, and so to post a, a post print, that is free. Um, I, I think the issue is there, there is, depending on your field, um, I think people just aren't as used to it and getting a what is essentially a PDF of someone's personal Word document. I think there's a sense of, well, this is just off of somebody's computer. And, and so having that, this is, this corresponds uh, with the published article. It's just in a different format and put it in that that uh, pretty preprint if you want. But uh, essentially, yeah, I think the green um, open access gets around that because it is an entirely um, cost free, and it, it's something that it, it is very interesting. And it's not something I follow super closely, but it is interesting to see the publishers react to this. And because that's, I mean, honestly, we don't need the publishers to do any of this. We're doing all the work for free, our, yeah, all the substantive work our, our, ourselves as, as researchers and, and peer reviewers and the editors maybe get paid some, but it's a just a nothing compared to the publisher's um, uh, profits on this. And so, you know, they're they're now trying to 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 shape the direction of this towards the um, gold journals and the hybrid uh, to, to have lots of options to pay them. Um, <laughs> and, and you know, so it, the formatting may not be quite as great or something, but you know, we can we can do all of this ourselves. I, I do think too, I think we're starting, we're starting um, a, a small one in, in special education. There are a couple others in our field that I'm aware of. Um, I'll be really interested to see some of these smaller diamond journals um, that are run on the cheap but don't charge article processing fees, how they compete with the more established journals that are making the publishers and other professional organizations a ton of money. Um, substantively, they could be just as good. They're, you have, the review board is just as good. There is no reason why we can't uh, disseminate and 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 format uh, things ourselves. It's just not what we're used to. Um, so yeah, I I really like to see us step away from kind of relying on the publishers to to organize things that that we can do ourselves, and, and it's costing um, either consumers or or researchers a ton of money in the process. Sorry, I'll get off my soapbox now, but. Yeah, uh, yeah. To me, that it, it is. It's just kind of a no-brainer that we should be going down this road. 
Yeah, no, I agree with that. And then Crystal is under the COS uh, uh, events comments there. I, um, I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but but we're we're, we're hoping to launch next year, and we have um, a small amount. We're, we're going to call it research and special education or rise. And there's also a, a journal and teacher prep run out of Rolling, Bowling Green. We were just talking to a colleague at um, University of Oklahoma who is starting a, a, a sing, or, or just got approval to um, develop a, a diamond journal around single case design research, which is a prominent design in, in special education. And it dawned on us that we do have kind of this almost like suite or coalition of, of smaller emerging diamond journals we were talking with someone at our library here who's in charge of this, who we've been working with just to develop this journal. And, and I don't have the name of it off the top of my head, but it, there, there is a kind of organization that, that works with, and they had it in, in math and linguistics and one other field that I'm forgetting, where they had kind of a consortium of um, these diamond journals that were working together to help each other out and to promote each other's work. Um, and wow, that'd be great if we could do something like that in education. Yes, yeah. No, I, I, I did, I thought about that too, Crystal. Yeah, it would be interesting to kind of pool resources in a way like that. Um, instead of having all of these different review boards that everybody's associated with, have one, and then it goes to one of these journals that's the best fit. Yeah. 